Hello and welcome to this virtual lecture course on electromagnetism. I'm Dr Andrew Mitchell and in this lecture I want to talk about time-dependent and dynamical phenomena, that is to say the classical theory of electrodynamics. In the first part of this course we focused exclusively on statics. We looked at the theory of electricity with time-independent electric fields due to static charge distributions. We looked at the theory of magnetism with time-independent magnetic fields due to steady currents, electrostatics and magnetostatics. We looked at the physics of electricity and magnetism separately, and we were able to do this because they are distinct phenomena in a static world. But of course the world is not static, and many of the interesting effects that we seek to understand and describe are due to uh, moving charges and charge distributions, or time-dependent currents. For example, even in the simplest case of an AC current in a wire, even that case is beyond the static description. And on the microscopic scale, an oscillating electric dipole produces complex time-dependent electric and magnetic fields. A time-evolving electric field generates a magnetic field, and a time-dependent magnetic field generates an electric field, so that even in the vacuum they can mutually sustain each other, and then we have light. So these two different effects are inextricably intertwined when we have a dynamical system, and we call this the study of electrodynamics. Maxwell's equations describe the full theory of electrodynamics, but we'll actually see that a deeper understanding of the fundamental nature of electrodynamics is provided by Einstein's reformulation of the problem in terms of the special theory of relativity. All of that is to come. But in this lecture, I want to introduce this new topic of dynamics by talking about Faraday's law and the flux rule. I want to talk about uh, Maxwell's correction to Ampere's law and inductance and the electromotive force. Okay, let's get down to work. So I want to start by discussing Faraday's law of inductance and the electromotive force. First of all, what is the electromotive force? The electromotive force is the work done per unit charge in driving that charge around a complete loop of the circuit. So mathematically, we can express the EMF in the following way as the line integral around the closed loop of the circuit of the force per unit charge, which is a vector, dot dl, where dl is the line element around the path of the circuit. And the EMF is measured in volts. So, for example, a battery would convert chemical energy into EMF, and a generator would convert mechanical energy into EMF. So an ideal resistanceless battery maintains an open circuit potential difference or voltage across its terminals equivalent to the EMF. The resulting electric field in resistanceless wires attached to this battery produces a force on the electrons that drives a current around the circuit, communicating the influence of the battery to distant parts of that circuit. However, we have to be a little bit careful because in dynamics, the scalar potential cannot be thought of as simply the electric potential anymore. The electric field is related to both the scalar and the vector potential when considering time-dependent phenomena in electrodynamics, as we'll see, and so the scalar potential has no direct interpretation as a potential energy. But nevertheless, the EMF does do work um, in driving a charge around a circuit, and this can be kind of interpreted as a potential difference or a voltage. So first we'll consider the EMF due to a battery. Here we'll think of a situation where everything is static in the sense that we have a constant current flowing in uh, the wires and the fields that are generated are time independent. There is a force uh, which acts inside the battery and there's also an electrostatic force, 
which communicates the, um, the effect of the battery to distant parts of the circuit and keeps the current flowing around the circuit. We don't have to worry about any magnetic forces because magnetic forces do no work, so they don't contribute to any kind of EMF. So we can write that the total force per unit charge is equal to a force uh, due to the source, which is in this case the battery, uh, plus uh, the electric field, which of course is a force per unit charge on a charged particle and contributes to the work done um, driving that charged particle around the circuit. And in particular, the force Fs is something that typically resides only inside uh, the battery, so it's only in a portion of the loop of the entire circuit. So when we are calculating the EMF, according to the formula that I wrote on the previous slide, which amounts to basically the definition of the EMF, we see that we can break this integral down into two pieces, one for Fs, the, so the force inside the source, which here is the battery, and one for the uh, electrostatic field. However, we know that the closed line integral of the, an electrostatic field is equal to zero when we're considering a closed loop, and of course this circuit is a closed loop. And therefore, the EMF can be actually written as the line integral of the, uh, the source force uh, around the closed loop which in turn can be written as the line integral from the negative terminal of the battery to the positive terminal of the battery of the source force dot dl. And we choose the path from the negative terminal to the positive terminal of the battery to yield a positive EMF, indicating that work is done on the electrons moving around the circuit. Now, for an ideal source of EMF, for example a resistanceless battery, the net force on the charges must be equal to zero. And since the total force is Fs plus the electric field, E, if the total force is equal to zero, then we find that Fs is equal to minus the electric field. And so this allows us to write the um, electromotive force uh, in terms of the electric field inside the battery. We have that the EMF is the open path integral of Fs dl, which is equal to minus the open path integral of the electric field dot dl, where we're just considering the integral inside the battery. And this integral um, of the electric field over some finite path here from the negative terminal of the battery to the positive terminal is exactly the definition of the electrostatic potential, the potential difference V between the terminals of the battery. Therefore, the EMF has the same value, but the opposite sign as the integral of the electric field aligned with an internal path between the two terminals of the battery. So this is why we can think of the EMF as a voltage and why it's measured, of course, in volts. It's actually a bit unfortunate that the EMF stands for the electromotive force because you can see here that it's not actually a force. It is the integral of a force per unit charge or the work done. And so we see from these expressions that the electrostatic field uh, created by the separation of positive and negative charges inside the battery exactly cancels the forces producing the EMF inside the battery. The function of the battery is to establish and maintain a voltage difference equal to the electromotive force, and the resulting electrostatic field drives the current around the rest of the circuit. It is the electrostatic field that keeps the current flowing in all distant parts of the circuit, so, for example, when you flick the light switch on, the lights in the room come on you know, almost instantaneously, and that's because of um, the electric field that's been set up inside the circuit. It's not because the electrons themselves are moving quickly inside 
the copper wires of the circuit. In fact, the electrons are moving at roughly something like a, a millimeter per second. So the electrons are actually moving very slowly inside the circuit. It's the electric field which communicates the effects of the battery to distant parts of the circuit. And of course, that can happen very quickly indeed. You might also be wondering why in this analysis we've used uh, the formalism of electrostatics. We've assumed that the electric field is constant and that the current is steady. In fact, this is actually the case, apart from some very quick transient dynamics that occur right at the beginning when one connects the battery into the circuit. The current through the circuit is actually constant, uh, not just in time, but also everywhere around the circuit. And that's because if it were not to be constant, then there would be a pileup of charge within different parts of the circuit. And this would produce enormous electrostatic uh, fields, which would uh, produce enormous forces on the electrons inside the wire. And these forces would get the electrons in the wire uh, moving and redistribute the charge inside the circuit. And of course, that all happens extremely quickly. And the net result is that the charge distributes itself evenly around the circuit and flows in a steady current. Next, I want to consider a different possibility, that of so-called motional EMF or the induced EMF. And of course, this is relevant to the situation of generators. This is probably the most common situation of all of them. This is where we move a wire through a magnetic field and a current is induced in that wire. So let's consider the following situation. Imagine that we have a uniform magnetic field, B, pointing into the page. And now we imagine uh, a circuit, which is just a wire loop, which is partially inside this field region and partially outside. And we'll imagine that this circuit contains a resistor. Now, to make this into a primitive generator, we imagine that we drag this entire wire loop to the right-hand side, and we do this uh, with a velocity, let's say, of v. So let's just annotate this diagram a little bit with some uh, useful things that we'll need. Let's call these positions uh, a, b, c, and d. This distance inside, the, the sort of horizontal distance inside the magnetic field region, we'll call x, and we'll call this constant uh, height here h. Notice, of course, that x is a function of time, because as we drag the, the wire loop to the right-hand side, x is going to get smaller. So what about the forces acting in this situation? Well we have a magnetic field that's pointing into the page, and we have charged particles, namely the electrons, which are in the wire, which are being dragged to the right-hand side. So we can use the Lorentz force law for the magnetic part of the force, is the charge, which is the charge in the electrons, minus E, times v cross b. v is the velo velocity and b is the magnetic field. So here we use the right-hand rule and we discover that the magnetic force is pointing upwards in the plane of the page. So what about the EMF? This is defined, as before, as the closed loop line integral around the circuit of the force per unit charge dot dl, where dl is the line uh, element as we integrate around the path of the circuit. So this dl is pointing vertically upwards as we go from a to b in this diagram, if we're going clockwise. It would be pointing from left to right as we go from B to C, and so on. It'd be pointing from uh, right to left as we go from D to A. And so the magnetic 
component of the force, which is pointing vertically upwards in the plane of the page, is parallel to the path taken as we integrate around the circuit as we go from A to B, but it's perpendicular as we go from B to C and from D to A. The part of the circuit that's outside of the magnetic field um, doesn't experience any magnetic force because, it's, uh, because the magnetic field is zero there. And so when we do this uh, integral to calculate the EMF, uh, we have a very simple result, which is simply uh, VBH. And notice that we perform this integral as an instant in time. So we see from this that by dragging this wire to the right-hand side, we generate an EMF in the circuit. However, it's also important to notice that the magnetic force here is not responsible for doing the work on the electrons. It is responsible for establishing the EMF, but the magnetic force is not itself doing any work. This is because magnetic forces never do work, as we discussed in a previous lecture. The um, explanation for this is extremely simple. If we consider the work done by a magnetic force is the integral of F uh, dl. However, here, the line integral and the line element, dl, are along the path taken by the charged particle that the work's being done on. It is not, as in the definition of the EMF, around the closed uh, loop of a circuit. The line integral here is along the path of a charged particle upon which the magnetic force is doing work. We can replace the line element, uh, dl, here by the velocity times a time element dt. That's because a certain displacement dl vector arises due to a velocity v in a time dt. But of course, because the magnetic force is v cross b, um, the magnetic force is mutually perpendicular to both the velocity v and to b. And so when we're taking the integral here, we actually have the integral of v cross b dot v dt, which is always exactly equal to zero, because v cross b is perpendicular to v, and then we dot it into v, and that gives us zero. So the obvious question arises, if the magnetic force that we have here is not doing the work, uh, and the EMF, of course, is the work done per unit charge in driving uh, that charge around the circuit. If the magnetic force is not doing that work, then what is doing the work? And the answer is, of course, that we are doing the work by, by having to drag this circuit to the right-hand side. That implies that as we're dragging this circuit to the right-hand side, there's some kind of counter force or some kind of resistance to doing that and we're doing work against that force. So what is that force? Well, the answer there is that once we start dragging the circuits to the right-hand side, the EMF causes a current to flow. And so if we imagine the current flowing clockwise around this loop, um, if we imagine the current flow, the part of the current that's flowing from A to B, it's moving upwards, but we're also dragging the loop to the right-hand side, and so overall, there is a path of the current that is not moving vertically upwards, but diagonally. And therefore, according to the right-hand rule, there is a component of the magnetic force that is in the opposite direction, namely um, acting from right to left. And that is the force against which we have to do work when dragging the circuit. And that, of course, is the work done that ultimately drives the electrons around the circuit. So again, the magnetic force establishes the EMF, but does no work. It is us that do the work by dragging the circuit to the right against these resistive forces. Now, all of this can be nicely reformulated in terms of the so-called flux rule. 
So first of all, let's define the magnetic flux, phi, to be the integral of the magnetic field through some vector area dA in some region. So we're thinking here of a magnetic flux as the number of field lines, if you like, that are piercing through some particular surface. So if we consider the example we were just discussing, the magnetic field flux through um, the part of the circuit embedded in the magnetic field would simply be B H X. The area of the circuit embedded in the field is H times X, and the magnetic field strength is B. And since H is constant and B is constant, if we take the time derivative d phi by dt, then we simply get b h dx by dt, which of course is the definition of the velocity that we're dragging the circuits to the right with. Actually, that's not quite right. We also need a minus sign in here because as we drag the circuits to the right-hand side, x is getting smaller. And so dx by dt actually is minus v. But apart from that, we see that the expression for d phi by dt is almost exactly the same as our expression for um, the EMF. And actually, quite in general, uh, we find that the electromotive force, the EMF, is equal to minus d phi by dt where phi is precisely this magnetic field flux defined there. And this is called the flux rule for calculating motional EMF. And although we demonstrated its applicability here for the very simple case of a rectangular loop and a constant velocity and a uniform field and so on, actually it turns out this is a completely general rule and works in all circumstances. Of course, it was Faraday who famously explored these uh, phenomena of uh, magnetic inductance, and he put those concepts to good use in the so-called Faraday dynamo, which is pictured here. Um, this device consists of a metal disc that you can see here, and the handle attached to it means that this disc can be um, rotated with some uh, angular velocity, let's say, call it omega. And then over here, we see a strong bar magnet, a permanent magnet, the likes of which we were talking about in, in, in previous lectures. And uh, this back magnet has a north pole and on the other side here, um, a south pole, such that there is a strong um, homogeneous uniform magnetic uh, field B uh, acting there. And one thing you can see if you look carefully in this diagram is this object here, which I'll highlight in green. It is a, a metal sliding contact which um, brushes up against the edge of the disc. Um, also, what you can't see, probably because it's on the other side, but actually there's another um, wire, if you like, coming out from the center of the disc. And therefore, one can have a current that actually flows um, in the sort of radial direction from the center of disk to the edge where this sliding contact is. And the reason uh, why we have these contacts here, of course, is that as we crank this handle and get this metallic plate to move, the electrons in the plate will be moving, and they'll be moving in this magnetic field. And that will induce, by the flux rule, a current to flow in the circuit. If, for example, we put a uh, resistor here of some sort. So that's uh, Faraday's dynamo. And the nice thing about this, of course, is that it can sort of be uh, perpetually sustained just by uh, rotating this handle. In the previous example, we had a rectangular uh, like wire loop and then we pulled it through a magnetic field, but once it's, uh, once it's left the magnetic field, then that's the end of the story. Here, of course, the nice thing is that you can keep cranking the handle and keep generating uh, a current in the circuit. So let's do a little calculation with what we know from the flux rule and the definition of the electromotive force. Um, 
for a system uh, that looks akin to this Faraday dynamo, we'll make a few simplifications of this system. But what I want to calculate is what actually is the current that's induced as we, uh, as we crank this handle. So consider the following setup. Imagine that we have a metal disc, uh, this time orientated horizontally, and it is allowed to spin on its axis via a metallic axle. And we'll say that the rotation uh, is in this sense uh, with an angular uh, velocity omega. So the metal disc, uh, let's say it's of radius A, <coughs> Is rotating with an angular velocity omega and we see here that it's in a uniform magnetic field B which is perpendicular to the disk and so the idea is that um, because of the sliding contacts here and here um, we will be able to get a current to flow um, by traveling up this axle and then basically across this disk in order to complete the circuit. And in this circuit, I've placed a resistor R here against which we can uh, do work. So the question is, what is the current that flows in this uh, circuit due to the rotation of the disk in this perpendicular magnetic field? Okay, so what is the velocity at a given point along this dotted line here? on the spinning disk. Well, the velocity is simply V equals omega R uh, for a given radius from the center R. And this, of course, applies uh, inside the spinning disk. So we're talking about a radius R that is between zero and the, uh, the, the actual radius of the disk itself, R. So the magnetic force uh, per unit charge is, of course, V cross B. Uh, and by using the right-hand rule, we can see that this force is going to be in the radial direction. And so simply, uh, V cross B is omega R B in the R hat direction. R hat is, of course, the unit vector in the radial direction. So with this, we can easily calculate the EMF as the integral around the circuit of the uh, force per unit charge integrated around the uh, closed loop uh, of the circuit. But of course, the uh, magnetic force is only applying uh, in the part of the uh, the circuit which we in which we have a spinning disk that's the part where we have uh, a velocity v to our, our charge carriers and therefore we can reduce this integral to the integral between a radius zero to a um, of uh, the the magnitude of the magnetic force dr, which is simply omega b, the integral from zero to a over r dr, well, that's a pretty simple one, and it gives us a half omega b a squared. Very good. So that's the electromotive force in this system. And of course, this is equivalent to an effective potential difference, V. We also know, as usual, that V equals IR. So the current, I, is equal to V over R. We have a resistor in the circuit. We have an effective voltage coming from the EMF. So this is basically the EMF over R, which is omega B a squared over 2r. And that's the final answer. So indeed, we are able to get a current flowing in the circuit by rotating this disk 
uh, at an angular frequency omega and connecting it to these sliding contacts and an external circuit with a resistor R. So from the definition of the EMF, the electromotive force, as the work done per unit charge in moving that charge around a circuit, we were able to derive the flux rule, which tells us that the EMF is related to the rate of change of magnetic flux. And the magnetic flux is the flux through a circuit loop, where we're considering here, notice, a single wire loop. So we should be careful if we have something more complicated with many wire loops, um, then we have to consider the, the total flux through all of the loops. But through a single loop, the magnetic flux um, phi is just given by the integral of the uh, over a vector area dA of the magnetic field B. So um, in this form, we can calculate the electromotive force. And what we see from this very general formulation is that whenever or why ever a magnetic flux changes through a wire loop, then an EMF will be induced. One quite handy rule of thumb to see in which direction the EMF is induced is uh, so-called Lentz's law. And Lentz's law states that nature hates a change in flux. So why is this? Well, the EMF that's due to a change in flux induces a current. And by Ampere's law, this current itself generates a magnetic field. It so happens that this induced field reduces the effect of the applied field so as to minimize the flux change. So nature contrives it so that when we have a change in flux, the system responds in a way to minimize that change in flux. And that is the content of Lenz's law. And it allows us to predict the direction of the current and the uh, sign of the EMF. So let's now try to take the flux rule and from it uh, derive Faraday's law. And we'll do this for the case of motional EMF. So, for example, the case of um, a generator where uh, we don't have a battery present. So we have that um, the EMF is minus the rate of change of the flux. So let's just substitute in the expression for the flux. And we can, of course, bring the time derivative inside the integral because we're integrating over the area, not the time. So those operations commute. And we have this. But we also have another expression for the EMF, which is the integral around the circuit of the force per unit charge. And um, the force per unit charge is, of course, just the um, electric field when we're doing this integral. Because we don't have a battery, we're just talking about motional EMF, so there's no other source forces here like we had uh, at the start of the lecture. And also, um, the electromagnetic force is the Lorentz force, which consists of an electric part and a magnetic part, but of course, the magnetic part of the force does no work, so of course does not contribute to the EMF. So the only contributing factor is here um, the electric field integrated around the circuit to closed loop the circuit. And of course, we've seen this kind of expression before in electrostatics. The integral of the electric field around a closed loop is equal to zero in electrostatics. But as you can see here, when we're talking about a dynamical situation with a, an EMF, uh, it's not equal to zero, and that's actually correct. So what we see is that one of the results from electrostatics is broken when we have a dynamical system 
of uh, moving wires and moving uh, charges and so on. So this object on the right hand side is not equal to zero um, in the case of dynamics. It's equal to zero in electrostatics only when we would have uh, an EMF equals to zero. Okay, so what can we do with this piece of information? We've uh, apparently derived an equivalence between the rate of change for the magnetic field integrated over some uh, vector area here and also this uh, uh, line integral of the electric field around a closed loop. So let's try to manipulate this a little bit. Let me just write it out again. We have the closed loop line integral of the electric field, dl, is equal to minus the integral of db by dt integrated over this vector area. The vector area, of course, by the way, is just the area of the, of the current loop or the area of the, the circuit. Um, and, but the, the vector is the vector that points normal to this surface at every point. Okay, now we'll use uh, one of our favorite tricks that we've used many times in this course, which is a result from uh, vector calculus, uh, namely Stokes's law, Stokes's mathematics theorem, I should say. Stokes has his name attached to many things, which is that we can write, um, the uh, line integral of a vector field in terms of the area integral of its curl. And this, therefore, gives us the curl of the electric field dotted into the vector area dA and integrated over that area. And then on the right-hand side, we have actually something that looks similar. We have a, the, the integral of something over the vector area. And so we can compare now the left-hand side and the right-hand side of this equation because they're both integrals over the same uh, circuit with the, with the vector area there. And one way of thinking about this is that we can do this for any circuit and we could imagine um, making this, uh, this loop smaller and smaller and smaller until we just have a single point and this therefore gives us an equivalence. That's the curl of the electric field is equal to minus uh, dB uh, by dt. And that, of course, is Faraday's law in differential form. And of course, note that if we were talking about the static situation where we didn't have uh, a changing flux, we didn't have a time-dependent magnetic field, then the right-hand side of this equation would be equal to zero. And then we'd have that the electric field was irrotational, it had zero curl. And that was a situation we studied earlier in the course when we looked explicitly at electrostatics. But here, from Faraday's law of induction, we see that uh, a changing magnetic field can also induce an electric field. So electric fields we know can be sourced by uh, a charge distribution. That's what we saw in electrostatics. But now we see that they can also be sourced by a changing magnetic field. Of course, this result that we've derived here is rather interesting because we started off with the idea of a fixed magnetic field and dragging a, uh, a wire loop through that field and inducing a current in the wire loop. And we related that to a change in the magnetic flux. And from the flux rule, we've derived Faraday's law. But Faraday's law appears to be telling us that a changing magnetic field generates an electric field. So this is actually rather a different kind of thing. In fact, Faraday discovered this law by conducting three different kinds of experiments. Let's look at those now. So Faraday considered three different situations. 
simplified illustrations of which I've given here. So let's consider the first one. In experiment one, Faraday considered um, the case that we already talked about, where we have a static magnetic field, a wire loop that comprises a circuit, and then we drag this wire loop to the right-hand side, and it induces a current. So the circuit is moved to the right with a velocity v in the static magnetic field, and what was observed experimentally as an experimental fact is that a current is induced in the circuit. And this is the result that we are able to rationalize and describe uh, via the concept of the electromotive force. In Faraday's second experiment, he considered a reciprocal situation. Here, he considered um, a magnetic field that was moving to the left with the same velocity but uh, opposite sign. So I've indicated here that the velocity of the magnetic field is minus v. Um, so the way we imagine this is we have some kind of uh, bar magnet, let's say, that's producing this magnetic field, and we just move the bar magnet to the left-hand side. So the region of, uh, of the magnetic field is moving to the left. And this time, our uh, wire loop, which comprises our circuit, is not moved. We keep this static. Yet we find um, that still a current is induced in the circuit. And indeed, it's the same current that is induced in the circuit. So comparing experiment one and experiment two, in experiment one, we have a fixed magnetic field and move the circuit to the right. In experiment two, we have a fixed circuit and move the magnetic field to the left. And what we see is that the same current in, is induced in both cases. And of course, this should actually sound uh, correct to you because we have the concept of relativity. There is no preferred or absolute uh, inertial reference frame. So for example, I could consider a reference frame of the laboratory in which I move the wire loop to uh, the right-hand side, but then I could also, and that's happening in experiment one, but I could also, in that same physical situation, adopt a reference frame uh, co-moving uh, with the circuit, so that in that reference frame, the circuit appears to be static, and the magnetic field appear appears to be moving in the opposite direction. So experiments one and experiments two are actually related by the principle of relativity. I'm not talking here about Einstein's relativity, just the basic idea of relativity, Galilean rel relativity even. So what we have is the, the notion um, that it, I can either move the circuit or I can move the magnet and I will get the same result because the only thing that matters is their relative motion. So this equivalence between experiment one and experiment two is actually contained within the flux rule because the flux rule doesn't care how the flux comes to change. The only thing that enters the flux rule is the, uh, the quantity d phi by dt. It's the rate of change of the flux that matters. And you can see that um, in experiment one and experiment two shown here, um, in both cases, the flux is changing at the same rate. One, because we're dragging the wire to the right, so the region of the circuit that's exposed to the magnetic field is getting smaller. In experiment two, we're moving the magnet to the left. So again, the region of the, the, the circuit loop that is exposed to the magnetic field is reducing. So in both cases, we have the same rate of change of flux, and therefore, by the flux rule, we'd expect to generate the same EMF. So the flux rule has actually encompassed both experiment one and experiment two, and this makes eminent good sense physically because um, that's what one would expect from the principle of relativity. Finally, Faraday considered a third scenario in experiment three, and in this scenario, the idea was that neither the magnet nor the circuit wire loop were being physically moved, but actually what was changing was the strength of the magnetic field. 
And this could easily be done in practice, for example, um, by generating a magnetic field in a solenoid, which consists of um, a coil of wire and a current flowing through, through that. Um, and you could imagine having an AC current flowing through the wire, producing an oscillating magnetic field. So we imagine, however it's created, we imagine that there's an, a, a time-dependent magnetic field, which I've indicated here, B of T, the magnetic field strength is varying. It's still perpendicular to the page here, but it's varying in strength. But the region of the mag magnetic field and the wire loop itself are not physically moving. However, Faraday observed experimentally that this, still, this situation still induces a current in the wire loop. So what we see from this is that the uh, a current is really induced in the circuit due to um, a change in flux. So we're able to achieve the change in flux by moving the circuit, by moving the magnet, or actually by having the field strength itself change with time. That would give rise to um, a time-dependent flux, which would induce an EMF, and the EMF results in um, a current flowing around the circuit. So, in fact, all three of these experiments lead to the concept of the flux rule, and they're sort of universally captured. All of these different uh, scenarios are universally captured by the flux rule. And we've just seen that that's basically equivalent to Faraday's law. Now, it's worthwhile to think a little bit more about this, because whilst the same current flows in all of these different scenarios, the mechanisms by which the current is induced to flow are actually very, very different. In particular, let's look at experiments one and experiments two, which we argued earlier are actually exactly the same situation, just uh, related by the concept of relativity. Do we uh, occupy the frame of reference of the magnet, or do we occupy the frame of reference of the circuit? It doesn't matter, we would argue, because the only important thing is the relative movement of the two. But physically, these things appear to be rather different. In experiment one, we move the wire. The charges are moving in a magnetic field, and that means that we have a magnetic Lorentz force that drives the current. So the work done to do this per unit charge is the EMF. In experiment two, we move the field. There's no charges initially moving, so there is no magnetic Lorentz force. The velocity of the charged particles, which are the electrons in the circuit, is, is initially zero. But the electrons apparently do move, and a current flows. So what kind of force would induce the uh, charged particles, which are the electrons, in the circuit to start flowing in a current? Well, obviously that force must be the electric part of the Lorentz force due to an electric field. And yet here we don't see any electric field. So what it's telling us is that this changing magnetic field, presumably, must be generating an electric field. And that's actually what we saw when we derived uh, Faraday's law in differential form from the uh, flux rule. Now, of course, the remarkable thing is that even though we have two rather different mechanisms here, one is due to a magnetic force and one is due to an electric force, magically they seem to give rise to exactly the same current as must arise from the principle of relativity. So this might seem like rather a coincidence, um, but of course Einstein showed that this is not a coincidence and is the consequence of special relativity as applied to electromagnetism. So we'll explore that in due course. So now I want to talk a little bit more about the concept of inductance. Previously, we were considering one wire loop, a circuit, being moved in the presence of a magnetic field. But of course, a magnetic field can itself be induced by a current flowing in a wire. And so the possibility arises that we can have two wire loops with a current flowing in one loop, which in itself creates a magnetic field, 
and then that magnetic field induces a current in the second loop. And this is the idea of a mutual inductance. There is also the possibility, of course, that uh, a current flowing in, uh, in one wire produces a magnetic field um, that can actually produce like a counter current in the same loop, and that's called a self-inductance. So we'll look at the first scenario first. Imagine the following uh, picture. So we have some kind of arbitrary wire loop, which is our circuit. And we imagine that we have a current, I1, let's call it, that flows through this loop. This is loop number one. Now let's consider that we have a second loop, which is of some other shape, let's say, in a different position in space. And so the idea is that the current flowing through loop one generates a magnetic field, which I'll indicate by these red arrows here. And some of those magnetic field lines pierce this second uh, current loop, or the second uh, wire loop, I should say. So imagine something like this. These red things that I've drawn here are magnetic field lines. Uh, let's label it B here. So the idea is that some of those magnetic field lines pierce uh, the second uh, wire loop there. So we have a, let's say that we have a steady current through loop one. And the idea is this produces a, a magnetic field B1. Let me label this uh, field B1 here in the diagram to disambiguate it from any other uh, fields that we'll see. So we have a steady current in I, uh, through wire loop one, which is called I1. This produces a magnetic field, B1, and some of those magnetic field lines pierce the loop two. And therefore, we have a flux phi 2 through loop 2. And that magnetic flux phi 2 is simply the integral of B1 integrated over the vector area of the second loop. So I'll say it's dA2 vector. That's the definition of the field flux through loop 2 of the, of the magnetic field B1. We need to know B1, and we can get that from the bs Savart law. Why am I allowed to use the Biot-Savart law to calculate the magnetic field? Because here I said explicitly that we have a steady current, I1, through loop 1. So if it's a steady current, I can use um, the equations of magnetostatics, namely the Biot-Savart law. Therefore, I can calculate that B1 is mu naught over 4 pi times I1 times the closed loop integral around the circuit, which in this case is loop one, of 
the line elements along the path of that circuit, DL1, dotted into the script R uh, vector, unit vector, over script R squared. Remembering that this script R thing here is R minus R primed, the, um, the field point minus the source point, we consider the magnetic field B1 at a point in space R due to a current element R primed. The script R is the, uh, is the vector uh, displacement between those two things. So what we see from this um, is that uh, B1 is, of course, proportional to I1. That's the main conclusion. Um, we have to do this integral, which gives us some kind of prefactor, um, but that's just some number. In the end, B1 is proportional to I1. At least the magnitude is proportional to I1. And so we see that um, phi 2 here is something that is itself proportional to I1. And that's because it involves an integral of B, and B is proportional to I1. So this proportionality constant here, we give um, a name. We call it the mutual inductance. So phi 2 is equal to some constant m two one of the current i1. So I've given this mutual inductance here a label uh, subscript 2, 1 to indicate it's the flux phi 2 due to a current i1. So for a given um, situation uh, in, in, in the real world, we would have to calculate this mutual inductance, this m, and uh, it would involve details of the shape of current loop 2 um, due to that flux integral. Uh, and then we would also have to consider the shape and relative position of uh, wire loop 1, because that enters into the definition of B1 through the B.R. Savar law. Okay, so let's see if we can manipulate this a little bit more. Let's start again from our definition of the flux phi 2 due to the magnetic field B1 passing through the current loop number 2. We can relate this magnetic field B1 to the magnetic vector potential And as we looked in, at in magnetostatics, the magnetic field B1 is related to the curl of the vector potential A1. Again, I can use this definition because I'm talking about statics. At the moment, I'm just considering a steady current I1, which produces a steady or time-independent magnetic field B1 and corresponding time-independent vector potential A1. So here we have an area integral of a curl of a vector field, and we can use Stokes' theorem. We've seen it many times already in this lecture even, to write this as the vector potential A1 dot DL2. So now we've converted this area integral of, uh, of wire loop number two into a line integral of the vector potential around the uh, around this wire, around the boundary of this area, which of, of course is the wire loop itself, it's the circuit. So um, that's nice. We have a definition of the vector potential due to a steady current flowing in a wire, which we obtained from our study of magnetostatics. Which is completely equivalent, of course, to the Biot-Savart law. But here it is written out, and it's uh, in a slightly nicer form. 
than we see for the Biot Savart law. And therefore, putting that all together, we have that the flux phi 2 is equal to the current uh, i1 times mu naught over 4 pi, and now times the double line integral, one around loop one, and the other integral around loop two. And the integral itself is an extremely simple one. It's dl1 dot dl2, where those things are vectors. And they correspond to the line elements, which are tracing out the paths of loop one and loop two. And then we divide this by script r. Script r, again, is the, is the displacement between uh, the line elements on loop one at a given uh, point of the integral and line elements in, of loop two. So um, physically, we have something like this. We have loop one. Oh, that's, let's say that's loop two. We have loop one. We're doing an integral which takes a given point on loop one and some other point on loop two. So this lower thing here is corresponding to the line element dl1 vector. This one corresponds to dl2 vector. And we're integrating around both of these loops. So this dot on the, this blue dot on loop one is being integrated around that, that circuit. The blue dot on loop two is being integrated around that circuit. And this script R is this vector that just connects one to the other. So we just do the uh, line, the double line integral around both loops, uh, and the thing we're dividing by is the length of that vector. So we integrate over both the paths of both loops. So this is a pure geometric quantity inside here. It's something that depends on the size and shape of both of the loops and their relative positions. So um, from this expression, we can just uh, read off now the mutual inductance. We see that this quantity m21 is mu naught over 4 pi times this double line integral. And one of the nice things we see from this explicit expression is that it's completely symmetric in the, um, in the labels one and two. So what we can see is that it doesn't actually matter whether the current is flowing in loop two and inducing a flux in loop one, or whether we have a current flowing in loop one inducing a flux through loop two. The proportionality constant is actually exactly the same. So for example, let me just write this out mathematically. We have phi 2 is m21 times i1, but we could also write phi 1 is equal to m12 i2. And what we see from this expression, actually, is that this object m21 is equal to the object m 1, 2. So putting that all together, what we see is that m21 is equal to m12. We can write that phi 2 is equal to, let's just call it m of i1. phi 1 is equal to the same m times i2. And this m is precisely this mutual inductance. and it's a pure geometric quantity. It tells us what is the flux that can be induced through a given wire loop due to a current flowing in some other wire loop. Okay, so now a question might be, what about if we had a varying current I1 through loop one, which changed uh, as a function of time? Well, one might then expect 
that one would have a time dependent flux through uh, the while loop number two. And that would be related to the time dependent current through loop number one. And the proportionality constant is the mutual inductance. And therefore, we could look at the time derivatives of these objects. We could look at d5 by dt, and we could look at di by dt. And here I'm assuming that the mutual inductance m is not something that has a time dependence. Why is that? Well, because as we saw, that was just a pure geometric factor uh, being determined by the size and shape and relative position of the two wire loops in question. And if that's not changing in time, the only thing that's changing in time is the current through loop one, then we might expect uh, that the mutual inductance is time independent. Therefore, the rate of change of the flux is proportional to the rate of change of the current. Uh, and so the proportionality constant is the same as before. And of course, this expression allows us then to work out the induced EMF. as minus m times di1 by dt. So we have an induced EMF in uh, wire loop number two, which drives a current around wire loop number two in response to the changing current in one. So by having a changing current in one, we're able to drive a current around loop number two. That sounds all very nice, but of course it's not quite right, is it? Because this whole derivation of our mutual inductance assumes that we have a, a steady current and we used the, um, the laws of magnetostatics. Importantly, uh, for example, we used the Biot-Savar law and that Biot-Savar law is something that we uh, obtained from the static limit. So it's not strictly correct uh, that we can just use this equation phi is equal to m times i uh, and then assume that everything is time dependent. That's not actually uh, quite correct. In deriving these formulas we assumed that dB1 by dt is equal to zero and that di1 by dt is equal to zero, uh, but now we're saying that both the magnetic field and the current are time dependent. So we should properly use the full dynamical Maxwell's equations self-consistently to, to determine the EMF, but actually that's very difficult to do. Instead, um, we'll use the so-called quasi-static approximation. And the quasi-static approximation is that um, we will just go ahead and use this expression for the induced EMF anyway, even though we derived it um, from uh, using the laws of magnetostatics, which don't strictly apply here. Um, that might sound like not an approximation, but uh, just a random stab in the dark. Uh, but actually, it turns out that the quasi-static approximation of uh, assuming that we can use the Biot-Savart law, which comes from magnetostatics, in this context with a time-dependent uh, current, it turns out that actually using that is actually extremely accurate, provided that the magnetic fields are fluctuating um, rather slowly. If we have a current that is changing very, very quickly, and magnetic fields that are changing very, very quickly, then the Biot-Savart law is certainly uh, incorrect and gives us a very poor approximation to the, uh, to the fields. However, if the currents are varying slowly, then it turns out um, the Biot-Savart law is uh, rather more accurate than you might have thought. In the coming lectures, we'll return to this point and put on rigorous mathematical foundations exactly what we mean by the quasi-static approximation, and we'll see order by order where the Biot-Savart law succeeds and where it breaks down. This will allow us to say 
uh, with analytic certainty when it is allowed to use this approximation and when not. For the current purposes, let's uh, suffice it to say that we can use um, uh, the quasi-static approximation um, which is that this formula for the electromotive force is accurate when the current is not rapidly varying. It's an approximation, but it's rather a good one in the present circumstances. So let's put this into action with a simple example of two tiny wire loops. So let's imagine that we have, uh, for simplicity, circular wire loops of radius r1 and r2. Let's assume, when I say that they're tiny, let's assume that what we mean by that is that um, the separation uh, between them is much greater a distance than their radius. So R1 and R2 are much smaller than the script R, the separation uh, between the elements on the two um, on the two wires. So the separation between loops is large compared with the radius. Good. So just as a little cartoon, let's imagine that we have one wire loop orientated in this uh, orientation. This uh, wire loop has a vector area A1, which is a vector pointing perpendicular from this thing. Let's imagine that we have another wire loop elsewhere. I'm trying to indicate here that um, the radius R1 is and R2 is much smaller than the separation between them. So this is wire loop number one. This is wire loop number two. And we have a separation vector from a point on one loop to some other point on the other loop. And that is precisely this script R vector. So that's the physical setup. Now, since R1 over script R is much, much less than one, this dimensionless quantity is much, much less than one, we can actually use the magnetic dipole term to accurately approximate the full magnetic vector potential generated when a current flows around loop number one. So the full vector potential A1 is very accurately approximated by the dipole term of the vector potential, precisely because the internal dimensions of the current loop are so small in comparison to the separation between uh, the field point and the source point, which is described by this script R. And recalling that we actually worked out the, um, the multipole expansion of the vector potential in a previous lecture and identified explicitly the dipole term, uh, we can now write simply that to a good approximation the vector potential is the magnetic dipole moment of loop number one times script R, unit vector, divided by script R squared, um, where, just for a reminder, this M1 is equal to I A1 this thing is the magnetic dipole moment uh, 
Uh, notice here that this M is a lowercase m. It's not to be confused with the mutual inductance, capital M. And so using this definition, uh, we can just arrive at our final result, which is that the vector potential from loop 1 is well approximated by the vector area A1 cross script R divided by the unit vector divided by script R squared. And that's the situation when we have a current I1 flowing around loop number one. Um, with this, we can calculate the um, magnetic field B1 as the curl of the vector potential in the usual way. And I won't bother going through all of the maths of this, um, but one can write it in a coordinate free representation involving vectors and involve, uh, which is a bit of an involved calculation, but we can in the end end up with this result, which is a standard result. Looks a little bit complicated, but as I say, the benefit of this is that it doesn't depend on the coordinate representation because we just write it in terms of the dot product of vectors here. Good, so this turns out, therefore, to be the, uh, the magnetic field at a point R in space due to um, a current I1 flowing through the tiny loop I1. And we've arrived at this using um, this very simple approximation of the vector potential by its dipole term. So the next question is, what is the flux through loop two? The flux through loop two, called phi two, is equal to b1 dot a2 evaluated at the position of A2. Uh, and I'm not doing an integral here because I'm assuming that the, uh, the wire loop number two is very, very small. And so the magnetic field, which is uh, emanating a long distance away from wire loop two, is going to be essentially uniform over that area. And therefore, I can simply take B1 dot the vector area A2. And the idea is, that this thing is going to be equal to the mutual inductance, capital M, times I1. And we seek to find this mutual inductance. So I've just calculated B1, and now I can plug it into the expression, and I would obtain an explicit expression for the mutual inductance, which is as follows. And the nice thing that we see from this explicit calculation is this sort of reciprocal nature. If I swap the labels one and two, I get exactly the same expression. So this again substantiates the previous claim that uh, m21 is equal to m12. This is a pure geometric factor as you can see, just depends on the vector areas A1 and A2. It just depends on the, um, the separation between the two, which is this uh, script R, which we're assuming is basically constant around both of the integrals there. So this is a pure geometric factor. And the logic is that a changing current I1 through wire loop number one induces an EMF in uh, wire loop number two, because of the changing flux. So the EMF through loop number two is minus m di1 by dt. So again, this is within the quasi-static approximation, and we're assuming that we can use the same equation as usual to calculate the EMF uh, with a changing current I2 through loop one. 
and this EMF will induce a current I2, which in turn generates a magnetic field B2. Now, by Lenz's law, this induced I2, due to uh, the magnetic field uh, B2, is such to oppose the flux change. That means that an opposing electromotive force appears in loop number one as a consequence. So why is that the case? Well, we have a changing current through loop one that produces a magnetic field B1. Some of the magnetic field lines pierce wire loop number two, and because we have a changing uh, flux through wire loop number two, we generate um, an EMF, which drives a current I2, and the, and the current through loop number two induces its own magnetic field, B2, some magnetic field lines of which pass through loop number one. And so there's some um, feedback loop here, and Lenz's law is telling us that this feedback is precisely to oppose the flux change. We have to do work against these mutually induced EMFs to keep a current flowing through loop one. We can't just have a current flowing um, perpetually um, because of this concept of the mutual inductance, we have to do work to continually keep that current flowing through number one. So a good question now is exactly how much work is required to keep the current I1 flowing through wire loop number one. Well, let's recall that the EMF is the work done per unit charge in driving a charged particle around a circuit. So here we're we have electrons moving around the circuit, which have uh, negative charges. So a small increment in the work done, dw, is therefore equal to um, the EMF through wire loop number one times dq1. And actually there's a minus sign because the charge carriers are electrons which are negatively charged. So the EMF is the work done per unit charge so dW is related to dQ, and the proportionality constant is exactly the EMF. So if we now take the time derivative on both sides, we see that the rate of change of work is proportional to the EMF, or equal to minus the EMF, actually, times the rate of change of the charge, but the rate of change of the charge is, of course, just the current. And given that we're talking about wire loop number one, this is the current through loop number one, I1. And now we can relate the EMF to the rate of change of current through number two, through the mutual inductance. As follows. And we see that on both sides of the equation we have uh, a d by dt, uh, and therefore we can integrate both sides with respect to time to obtain the work done. It's simply the product of the two um, currents, i1 and i2, times the mutual inductance for the two loops, which is capital M. And we know what um, the induced current is, we know what the original current is, and so we can actually determine this explicitly for the specific example that we were considering, and we get the following. It depends on the magnetic dipole moments for the two uh, wire loops. M1 and M2, and the separation vector between the wire loops, which is script R. Let's now take a look at the phenomenon of self-inductance. First of all, let's consider a single, simple wire loop. And I'll imagine that there is a current flowing around this loop, a current I. 
So a changing current, I of t, generates a changing magnetic field. This induces an electric field by Faraday's law. But by Lenz's law, this induced electric field is such to oppose the flux change. So electrons in the wire loop must do work to move against this electric field. They're doing work basically against the Coulomb force. So a changing current in a wire loop produces a back EMF that opposes the change. And this all happens in the same wire loop. And once again, the field, and therefore also the flux, is proportional to the current. And so we will define the self-inductance as the constant of proportionality between the flux and the current. So this is the defining equation for the self-inductance. In practice, any wire loop will have a self-inductance. So how do we calculate this L? Well, we just have to find the uh, flux phi and its dependence on the current I. And when we've done that, we'll be able to define a back EMF, which is the rate of change in the usual way of the flux. So the EMF that's generated due to this uh, changing flux will be minus L di by dt, because the uh, EMF is minus uh, d phi by dt. It's the flux rule. And this EMF is referred to as a back EMF. So I'll put a label B here. And that's meant to indicate the fact that it's an induced EMF due to the changing current. So from the proportionality of the flux to the current, the proportionality constant being the self-inductance, we can kind of see physically what this inductance is. It's like the mass in a mechanical system. The larger the mass, the harder it is to get a change in momentum or velocity. Likewise, the larger the self-inductance, L, the harder it is to change the current in a wire. It's a kind of susceptibility that is telling us how hard it is to get a current flowing in a given wire loop. And again, it's a pure geometric quantity, depending only on the size and shape of the wire loop in question. One rather vivid example of uh, the concept of self-inductance is when you have an electrical appliance plugged in uh, to the mains electricity, and then you pull out the plug, uh, often it will draw a little spark. Um, notice that when you plug in a plug into the, um, into the mains electricity, uh, you don't see a spark. Only when you pull the, um, the, the socket out of the wall do you see a, a little spark. And that's actually a consequence of the self-inductance. Why is that? Well, it's because when you make a break in a circuit, um, the current basically instantaneously drops to zero. Of course, nothing is really instantaneous. What happens is that the current uh, decreases extremely rapidly to its zero value. And so what that means is that um, the rate of change of the current when you pull the socket out of the wall is ex very, very large, extremely large. Di by dt is very, very large. And that generates a back EMF, which is supposed to counter the change. So the change is that suddenly we've got a, a current that's dropping to zero. Um, we have a huge di by dt. And then by this uh, expression here, we know that there's uh, an induced EMF, which is trying to keep the current flowing. And that's why it forces um, a little spark uh, across even the gap in the circuit to do anything it can to sort of keep the current going. It's trying to oppose the flux change. But by contrast, when you pl put a, um, a, a socket into the, uh, into the wall, the current is initially zero. And so when the current begins to flow, we have um, a di by dt that's of the opposite sign. The current is increasing. And so the back EMF there is trying to counter the change. And so the induced back EMF when you put the socket into the wall, 
actually is trying to slow down the increase in the current. So it's, uh, it's kind of the opposite effect, if you like. So let's do a little example of this to work out how the current actually does begin to flow when you connect um, a battery, let's say, to some simple circuit. So consider the following simplified circuit. Imagine that we have a battery which supplies a constant EMF, which is this E0. Imagine that we have a battery connected into a circuit which contains a resistor of resistance R and an inductor of inductance L. And the question is, what current flows? So first, we need to know what the total EMF is. This total EMF will be the sum of the EMF provided by the battery um, plus the uh, induced EMF or the back EMF resulting from the self-inductance. And that quantity is minus L di by dt from the above expression. Now, we can relate the total EMF to the voltage and V equals IR for a circuit. And so here we have a first order differential equation involving the current. So we have a di by dt on the left hand side and i on the right hand side. So this is an equation that uh, we can easily solve for the current. And i of t is found in general to be this. Uh, general expression, where here we have a, uh, a constant k, which is a constant of integration when we solved uh, this general form of this first order differential equation. Um, however, we can use some boundary uh, conditions to fix this value of k. In particular, we know that at time t equals zero, um, we have disconnected the battery, and then instantaneously we plug it in, and then we want to see what happens to the current. So we have a boundary condition, which is that i of t equals 0 is equal to 0. And by plugging that in, we can uh, determine the value of k, which must therefore come out to be minus epsilon naught over r to cancel uh, that first term. And so overall, we have an expression i of t is equal to epsilon naught over r, r of 1 minus e to the minus r over l t. And we can actually identify the quantity r, uh, l over r as like uh, some kind of characteristic time scale, which I'll call tau. So this is called the time constant, and it basically tells you uh, how long you have to wait until the current has uh, built up to uh, 1 minus 1 over e, uh, or roughly around 63% of its asymptotic uh, infinite time value. So this is like a characteristic time uh, for, for how the current approaches its uh, long time uh, limit value. And so we can sketch what's going on. Let's plot here uh, time against the, uh, the current. And we'll see that it starts off at zero due to our boundary condition. And then it slowly increases and then reaches its uh, asymptotic um, long time value, which you can see from the equation. Uh, must be epsilon naught over r. So that's this long time value here. So that's a nice little example which demonstrates the use of this concept of self-inductance. The final topic I want to talk about in today's lecture is Ampere's law. But I want to revisit the concept of Ampere's law in the context of the dynamical systems we've been considering in today's lecture. 
So let's look at Ampere's law as it was introduced in our study of magnetostatics. We had that the curl of the magnetic field was equal to the current density J. And we uh, saw many examples of this. Um, however, it turns out that in dynamical systems, there's uh, a serious flaw with this equation. And that can be revealed simply by taking the divergence of this expression. So if we take the divergence of both sides of this equation, we see on the left-hand side the divergence of the curl of the magnetic field, and then on the right-hand side we have the divergence of J. There's a problem with this because on the left-hand side, because we have the divergence of the curl, this is guaranteed to be equal to zero just by um, a ma the mathematical identity from vector calculus. So the divergence of the curl of any vector, uh, vector field is equal to zero. And so what that would imply is that the divergence of the current density on the right-hand side was equal to zero. But in general, the divergence of the current density is not equal to zero. In fact, we actually know something about the divergence of the current density um, from our studies of charge conservation. In a previous lecture, we looked at charge conservation in general, and this gave rise to the continuity equation. which tells us not just about the global cons uh, conservation of charge, but the local conservation of charge, meaning that the charge inside a given finite region of space can decrease so long as an equivalent amount of charge passes through the walls of that container. The continuity equation tells us that the divergence of the current density is equal to minus the rate of change of the charge density. And so we know that in general, in a dynamical system, the divergence of J is not equal to zero, but rather the rate of change of the charge density. So the problem is that if we go to Ampere's law, which is something that we defined in the world of magnetostatics, we see uh, the divergence of the curl on the left hand of the left hand side of the expression is equal to zero, but the right hand side is not equal to zero. And so what this implies is that there's something missing from the right hand side of Ampere's law, which will cancel the divergence of uh, of the the current density that we see there. That's one thing that we require for the continuity equation to be satisfied. And don't forget, the continuity equation just comes from very basic considerations of charge conservation. On the other hand, we also know that Ampere's law is actually correct in the world of magnetostatics. So any correction that we add must be irrelevant if we go to the time-independent limit. And this is precisely what Maxwell did. He also recognised that the charge density um, is related to the electric field through um, one of the other Maxwell's equations. And therefore, we can write the divergence of J simply in terms of minus epsilon naught times the divergence of the rate of change of the electric field, dE by dt. And so finally, uh, Maxwell proposed the following, 
and we will call this the Maxwell Ampere Law to indicate that it's uh, a correction to Ampere's original law, which is that the curl of B is mu naught times J, as before, from Ampere, plus an extra term, mu naught epsilon naught, dE by dt. So we see that um, the magnetic field is sourced not just by the current density, but also a changing electric field. Just as we saw earlier, that the uh, electric field is sourced not just by the charge density, but also the rate of change of the magnetic field in Faraday's law. So there's some kind of reciprocity here. So why would this uh, Maxwell Ampere law um, do the trick? Well, if we simply take the divergence of both sides, as before, the left-hand side is again equal to zero. The right-hand side is the divergence of j, which we know from the continuity equation is minus d rho by dt plus mu naught epsilon naught d by dt of the divergence of the electric field. By the way, in case you're worried that I'm commuting these various derivatives through each other, actually that's fine because they're partial derivatives and they're one of them's with respect to time, one of them's with respect to space, so these things commute. Uh, I can do those partial derivatives in any order. Um, and this thing here um, that I've written down there is at least this part of it, the divergence of the electric field. We know that that's, of course, minus, uh, sorry, we know that that's rho over epsilon naught from one of Maxwell's equations. And you can see that the epsilon naughts cancel, and then we have a d by dt of rho times mu, uh, but this time with a positive sign. And so this whole thing on the right-hand side, those two terms cancel, giving us zero, as they must. So Maxwell Ampere law um, ticks a number of boxes. It satisfies the continuity equation, which is a very basic uh, concept of charge conservation and locality. Um, it satisfies Ampere's law when we go to the time-independent limit, because if I imagine time-independent electric fields, then dE by dt is equal to zero, and that term drops out. So in the, li in the magnetostatics limit, we get back to Ampere's law as Ampere first conceived it. But in the dynamical case, we were missing a term, and Maxwell added it. So, finally, let's summarize Maxwell's equations. We're going to come full circle to where we started in this course. Um, we'll see now the, the true versions of Maxwell's equations in the fully dynamical system. We have that the divergence of the electric field is the charge density rho divided by epsilon naught. So that actually is something that didn't change. This is Gauss's law. So going to the dynamical world, this equation is the same. We have that the divergence of the magnetic field is equal to zero. This tells us that there's no magnetic monopoles. Otherwise, that equation doesn't have a name as such. We have the curl of the electric field. In electrostatics, this was equal to zero. In the dynamical world, we know by Faraday's law that the electric field can be sourced by a changing magnetic field. And we also have the curl of the magnetic field. In the static world, this was Ampere's law. We know from statics that the magnetic field is sourced by a current. But in the dynamical world, we have to add on Maxwell's correction, which tells us that 
the magnetic field can also be sourced by a changing electric field. So these are Maxwell's equations. There are eight equations altogether here. There are two scalar equations, that's the divergence of the electric field and the divergence of the magnetic field, these top two. And then there are two vector equations, which each have x, y, and z components. So there's three equations for the curl of the electric field, and there's three equations for the curl of the magnetic field. So really, hiding here are actually eight scalar equations. If we actually want to calculate um, the effect of the electric and magnetic fields on charged particles and currents, we need to know the Lorentz force law, which tells us that the force on a particle Q with charge Q in an electric field E and a magnetic field B is Q times E plus the velocity of that particle V cross B. This is Lorentz force law. And finally, we have the continuity equation. which is actually now contained in Maxwell's equations. So we don't actually really need to state this separately because it's already in Maxwell's equations. But it's such a fundamental equation, I think it's worth writing it again here on this summary of equations in electrodynamics. Okay, so that's the end of this lecture. Uh, we considered various things here. We looked at the dynamical world for the first time. We looked at the concept of electromotive force and mutual inductance and self-inductance. We looked at Faraday's law. We looked at the flux rule. We looked at Maxwell's correction to Ampere's law. In the next lecture, I want to explore some of the consequences of these equations. In particular, how the electric and magnetic fields are related to the energy and momentum. We'll see that the electric and magnetic fields can be thought of as containing energy and momentum. I'll also look at how magnetic changing the magnetic and electric fields uh, give rise to the phenomenon of light. So join me next time for another lecture in electrodynamics. <laughs>